Hi everybody, I hope you're well. Today I will read from a book titled Sigur Leverens, Architect of Death and Life, uh, edited by Kiran Long, uh, Johan Orn and Michael Anderson, and published by ArcDes in collaboration with Park Books. Kiran Long wrote, There is no Swedish architect with more influence on contemporary architecture than Sigur Leverens, or indeed more passionate advocates. Devotees travel from all over to study and draw his buildings and to examine the archive of drawings held at Arkdes. And the most adoring of his fans are and always have been architects themselves. It was his fellow architects who admired him most while he was still alive, helping him to secure his most important commissions. It was practicing architects writing about his work who kept his memory alive in the years after his death and who gave him his international reputation. There is a reasonable number of books about Leverence, but not an extensive library. Among architects it is the two late churches, St. Mark at Björhagen and St. Peter at Klippen, that inspire the greatest passion and devotion. These are, at first glance, brooding and serious works. They do not lend themselves to photography and are not made as cheerful, reproducible images. Highly unconventional in their construction, they reward close attention to the way materials are handled. It is curious that some of the architects who love the work the most are not entirely sure everyone should share their feelings. Adam Caruso, an important advocate for Leverent's work, wrote on the rigorous brick tectonic applied throughout St. Peter's. It is as though Leverent's is compelling us to confront the condition of our existence, all of the time. This is understandable in the mind of an 81-year-old architect, but one senses it is something of a burden on the small congregation. Another London-based architect, Peter Lynch, described the same church as being too much like a force of nature to be comforting. And yet the work draws a devoted public. Wherever you travel to see a Leverent's building, you find people proud of the places he made, committed to maintaining them as more than mere monuments. In contrast to the affection in which Leverence is held by architects and the wider public, there is a surprising lack of interest among those most engaged with the history of Swedish architecture. Perhaps uh, this relative neglect can be explained by the fact that Leverence was not a typical architect. He made works in a variety of styles that do not map perfectly to style-based time periods. Some of his buildings have seemingly very few precedents and only oblique relationships to models and types. He wrote little and certainly nothing that could be construed as a manifesto or statement of intent. For these reasons and others that I will explore more fully below, architectural historians have in the main not given full accounts of Leverence's work. This is not to say that Leverence is ignored. Far from it, no general history of modern architecture in Sweden is complete without photographs of his work. However, few historians have offered much insight into Leverence's place in the culture of 20th century Sweden. He is often merely listed as part of a generation of architects who brought modernism to the country in a forceful way around the time of the 1930s Stockholm exhibition. The churches are mentioned in books on the post-war church building tradition, but otherwise his late buildings are almost always considered as one-offs, artistically extraordinary but with little relation to the dominant trends in the 1950s and 1960s. Leverence's obstinate refusal to fit easily into stylistic categories causes problems for those trying to give an overview of Swedish modernism. Understanding what Leverence did not do, as opposed to what he did do, might be one way to get a better grasp of his place in history. Why, for example, did Leverence did not contribute to Acceptera, 
the famous manifesto of Swedish modernism published in 1931, he knew all the authors and was one of the most prominent designers in the 1930 Stockholm exhibition. And why did Leverens not realize any housing after his workers' housing in the 1910s? He designed prominent model homes at the Stockholm exhibition, but did not contribute a single unit to the Swedish state's gigantic program of house building in the 20th century. There may be practical and reasonable answers to the above questions, but it would be perverse not to admit that Leverance's life as an artist was lived at odds with the prevailing orthodoxies. His work stands for other values than those normally assigned to modern Sweden. So it is surprising that this member of the resistance has not drawn more attention from historians and thinkers looking to disrupt the received narratives of Sweden's relationship with architecture and design in the 20th century. The exhibition in 2021 at ArcDes is the first major monographic exhibition ever about Sigurd Leverens, and the four years of research and work that have gone into that and this book have, we hope, added new possibilities for the interpretation. There is so much in his work that is not yet fully understood or researched. Perhaps the most important ambition of this book is to broaden the overall picture of Leverens' life and work. What is missed is a deeper understanding of how Leverens' life was lived and how his practice simultaneously wove together many different themes and interests. Our research re-establishes the architectural richness of the late 1920s and early 1930s, easily Leverens' most diverse and prolific decade. During those years, while he was working constantly on the two cemeteries, he also made major contributions to the 1930 Stockholm exhibition in buildings, furniture and graphic design, and realized two major office buildings in Stockholm, one of them for a prestigious public client. Not only that, he produced a host of storefronts and interiors through Block, the company he set up for this purpose, and designed a major factory complex. He entered significant competitions, including the one for Bromma Airport. In short, he participated fully in an architectural culture that was beginning to rethink Stockholm as a modern metropolis. Through this volume, the reader has greater access to the drawings of these projects than ever before. It becomes clear that his work was as much concerned with everyday life, with consumption, technology, street life, neon, inui, as it was with religion and burial rites, or the junction between a brick and a piece of glass. The unique aspect of the research in this book is that it was carried out in a museum, with access to the original documents and drawings that Leverence left to the nation. In our work, we have been inspired by the material turn in humanities to focus again on object-based research. We are trying to make available the content of the works of Leverence, his artistic achievement, and understand what a collection of drawings reveals about these great works. We wish to return archival research to its place within an architectural discourse alongside the accounts by practitioners and historians. The exhibition and book should be seen in this context. Visit the exhibition if you are in Stockholm and ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for joining me today and see you in the next video. Bye.